Good morning, everyone. I hope you had a nice coffee break. So in addition to the kind introduction that Celia just made, I can add that I'm also chair of uh, the scientific uh, and infrastructure uh, advisory board for the Human Brain Project. And many of you, I'm sure, have heard about the Human Brain Project, but you may be wondering, you know, hey, what's going on? And Denmark is really part of it and what's going on. So um, the fact is that um, the Human Brain Project has now been running for almost 10 years. So uh, next year, I think will be the last year of Human Brain Project. And, um, and eBrains is a sort of continuation that has been building on some of the science, uh, the very good science that has been done in the Human Brain Project, but it is going to be an independent infrastructure. Uh, that will capitalize, obviously, on many of the things that you've already seen some examples of this. So the title of my talk today is From Basic to Clinical Neuroscience, and this is because I'm um, bridging between basic and clinical neuroscience. It will not be very much focused uh, on memory and learning, which we will hear about uh, very soon from a couple of other scientists. But um, I'm going to continue a little bit along the line with the atlases. All right, so I want to talk a little bit about the pig brain. You've heard about the rodent brain and the monkey brain and the human brain. But actually, what is special to Denmark is that we've been using the pig brain a lot. And it is an animal that is increasingly being used for uh, new scientific purposes. And, and why the pig? Well, first of all, it's closer to the humans than the rodents. Uh, it has a gyre, it has a cyto architecture that is really similar to the human brain. Uh, the evolutionary distance is much shorter when it comes to genetics. Uh, and uh, the pig has what we humans are so proud of that is our prefrontal cortex. So it has a very large prefrontal cortex. It's actually a really smart animal, much smarter than your dog at home. So uh, this relatively large brain also makes it amenable for uh, clinical neuroimaging and for doing extensive um, proteomics or all kinds of omics, basically. Uh, and then uh, it's not really associated with as uh, many ethical issues as the monkeys. So it's many years since we had monkeys for um, scientific purposes housed here in Denmark. I think it goes back more than 20 years. So it is uh, quite um, difficult to, to do that. Um, but of course, sometimes it's nice to have access to monkeys. In that case, you can use to collaborate with others. And here you can see what we like about, maybe we could get rid of this somehow so you can see it all, let me see. Somewhere here. Uh, this one maybe. We just need to get rid of this one in a short moment. So you can see here uh, the pig brain compared to the lysencephalic rat brain. Uh, and the mammal set, which is also listened to phallic, uh, is much closer to both baboons and humans. So um, what we've been doing a lot with these pigs, uh, both here and in Aarhus, is to use it for different imaging purposes. And um, we've been using it for PET scanning. We've seen over and over again that the predictive value of using the pig is much better than uh, the rodents. And it is, so far as it has been investigated, very close to um, the, uh, the non-human primates. Um, and you can do behavioral assessments. And um, I won't talk much about memory, but in fact, what we've been doing also here in Copenhagen is to develop some behavioral tasks, including memory tasks, um, object recognition tasks, or something called way why maze, where the pig needs to remember which way it took last time, it took a run, and they're actually quite fast learners. So you can do it, it's just it takes up more space. Um, so um, another thing which we've been using uh, these uh, pig studies for is for looking at behavior, drug occupancy, and uh, RNA sequencing or other omics. And this is a study we did some years back where we gave this little cybin, that is the psychedelic uh, compound uh, IV into the pigs. And we know from the rodents that they exhibit a special behavior that is related to the psychedelic. 
experience that we see in humans um, in terms of head shakes. Uh, and uh, the pigs also develop head shakes when they're given psychedelics. Uh, they also have a more variable behavior in terms of scratching and rubbing, but the head shake was what we were expecting, and uh, that is uh, uh, consistently seen after these IV injections. Then we can also do our rated tracer experiments. The psychedelics find and activate the sets only two way receptors. So here at the top right, you see uh, time activity curves after we've injected a radio labeled uh, CB36, which is an agonist radio tracer for the serotonin 2A receptor. And um, you can see uh, the blue one, uh, that's the time activity curve of neocortex uh, at baseline before the pig gets the drug. And then when we repeat it later, we can see that there is much lower binding, that's the red curve. Uh, and in this way, you can determine the occupancy, that is how much of the serotonin A receptor is occupied by uh, the psychedelic. And the green line is the pharmacokinetic uh, curve of, of the active metabolite, which is psilocin. And then uh, finally, you can also have a look at uh, the, uh, uh, the mRNA sequencing uh, and uh, look at uh, what kind of, um, of um, different pathways are regulated by the psychedelic uh, drug. Uh, in this case, we found that a number up to 19 different um, pathways were activated uh, during the psychedelic experience or one day after. And uh, one week after, uh, we had uh, also some of these preserved, mostly related to new inflammatory markers. So this is an example of how we have been using uh, the PIC as an intermediate uh, for translational research. Now, uh, how about uh, the atlas? We just heard about atlases. And what we've done uh, mostly is to bring, uh, use the standard atlases to bring the individual pig brain. Uh, so, so rather than bringing the individual pig brains into a standard atlas, we have instead uh, utilized to uh, make an idealized uh, pig atlas that we can then apply backwards uh, into uh, the individual space. And that comes with certain advantages that I will talk about today. But the work that was done here was to take uh, the Sakali uh, atlas, where someone um, uh, with um, histo histology had very uh, deta detailed parcellation of the brain, and then combined it with an MRI atlas. And then we transferred that into an MRI template based on our own pics. Uh, and then you can add that to a pet image, and you can also do a parcellation uh, that can uh, then uh, bring uh, everything into a new pet data space. That allows you to look at different regions, which you can see here, uh, where you can automatically delineate brain regions on MRI and pet images uh, from uh, the pictures in the individual space, brought into the MRI space. And here's the parcellated brain and the PET template of the serotonin 2 a receptor in this case. This is something that is also available uh, online as an open source. And maybe I want to give it just a brief comment here that uh, you can find many, many things on the internet. Uh, and some things are also open source. But what is special about eBrains in my mind is that uh, this is a, a one-site entry, hopefully where we in the long run will be able to collect many of these and do a quality assurance. And most importantly, to get some support for your work. So if you find something online, then most, most of the time you won't really be able to uh, interact with the scientists who made it. Uh, some people might want to do it, but uh, they do not have the resources. So it is an incredible amount of time that goes into uh, maintaining these resources and also uh, addressing questions and so on. Okay, so um, on to the human data. So we have over the last 20 years collected uh, pet data from healthy uh, adults uh, with different markers. In this case, it's the uh, serotonin system. Uh, and by doing that in a systematic manner, uh, we've been able to capitalize on that and to create uh, an atlas, as you see here, uh, on the serotonin transport, the 1A, the 1B, the 2A, and the 4, which are the traces that we currently have available for mapping uh, the, the receptor systems. 
And by comparing uh, the PET images uh, and normalizing them to autoradiography in humans, uh, we've been able to do it in a quantitative manner. So you get these data in picomole per mil. Um, and uh, this enables you to directly compare different brain regions uh, for their relative contributions uh, to these receptor systems. Uh, it's really key that you have specific and selective radio traces in this case, both for the autoradiography and for the PET imaging. Otherwise, you will uh, easily get a mix up uh, of different uh, targets. Now, um, many people use a proxy for protein. That is, uh, you, they use the Allen Brain Atlas, which is a wonderful resource, but remember, it only builds on six individuals. Um, and, but what the key message is for this slide is that you cannot really um, make sure that, or you have to make sure that the mRNA corresponds to the actual protein density, if you want to talk about protein density. And you can see that for some targets like the 5-HT1A receptor, there is a very good correspondence between what you measure uh, in terms of mRNA and protein. For others, um, since for instance, the 5 c 2 a receptor, uh, there is a really poor correlation. And this is, of course, because in the brain, you have uh, these proteins synthesized in the cell so and then they're transported to long distances to other brain areas and uh, this means that you cannot really rely on that so that's why we need to have these protein atlases rather than mRNA and here's another example where you could see how we normalized the benzodiazepine uh, receptor, the so-called uh, benzodiazepine receptor, GABA A, uh, and at the right you see the autoradiography and uh, uh, versus uh, the uh, PET measured uh, density of the GABA A receptor. So uh, these maps can be quite useful and have already been utilized for a lot of uh, clinical studies as well. Finally, I just want to wrap up a little bit about um, consensus. It's really important that the field as such has a consensus on how do we do things. If you do not have consensus, you can easily get conflicting results. This is one of uh, the most challenging things we see in new science these days, and I guess in any kind of new science, is how can we replicate our findings? And uh, to do so, um, we need to pull together a lot of uh, bright heads that work within the field, and this is what we did here, to obtain um, consensus on how do you publish and carry these uh, pet experiments out. Um, and this has now led to uh, another initiative, which is uh, funded by uh, NIHM uh, through the Brain Initiative and by the Novo Nordisk Foundation in a collaboration between uh, our group and um, the um, NIH and uh, a couple of other places. And the idea is to establish a PET archive as an extension of Open Neuro uh, with a standard format and content and then educate and seek uh, the feedback from the user com community. So this is what we are currently working on. I see this as something that uh, goes well hand in hand with eBrains and that we should make sure to implement um, both here and of course in North America or the entire world if you like, so that we can have these different modalities and use them uh, in a good manner. The uh, principles is that we, once we have a standard format, we can better meaningfully share and combine data and make people make contributions because the more you can build, uh, the more you can uh, make useful science out of it rather than using small data sets for different purposes as we sometimes see. So I think uh, with that, that uh, I just want to quit here and I'm happy to take any questions from you.